Hey everyone, welcome to another episode of the Tennis.com podcast with your hosts, Nina Pantic and Irina Falcone. In this episode, we're chatting with coach Dave Marshall, the director of the Dave Marshall Tennis and Fitness Center in Delaware, and the former coach of Bob and Mike Bryan. We saw a lot of players retire in 2020, including Maria Sharapova, Caroline Wozniacki, Yulia Gorgas, Pauline Parmentier, and of course, the Bryan brothers. They rewrote history together, winning 119 titles, including 16 Grand Slams across more than two decades on tour. Dave Marshall, one of their coaches, shares his tennis story on how he became a prominent coach that has worked with talented juniors, college players, and pros, including WTA Top 100 star Madison Brengel. Dave gives us his best stories from the locker room, including one about Roger Federer, and dives into his memories from working with the Bryans. And for those who don't know, these podcast episodes are also available to watch on Tennis Channel's YouTube page and Tennis.com's Facebook page. So here's our chat with Dave Marshall. All right, Dave, welcome to the show. It is so great to have you. Welcome, and uh, how are you doing? Uh, pleasure to be here. Thanks for having me on the show. Awesome. Tell us where you're at right now. You have an amazing backdrop for those watching on YouTube and Facebook. Tell us what's, uh, what's uh, new with you. Uh, yeah, so yes, a few pictures in the background. I'm at my club in uh, Lewis, Delaware. So that's where I am this morning, 830 in the morning, Eastern time. I don't know where you guys are, but if uh, you're out in the West Coast, it's a lot earlier than what we are. <laughs> we're in Florida. We're in Eastern time as well, so uh, we're, yeah. good. Okay. we're good. We're <laughs> good. We want our listeners to learn a bit about you, Dave Marshall. So tell us, how did you get into coaching and how did you discover the sport of tennis? Give us a little background. Yeah. So my father was a pretty successful business guy who loved tennis. So we used to play tennis all the time. We used to go up to the Poconos and a guy named Ed Faulkner was up there. Do you know that name at all? Ed Faulkner was the, one of the Davis Cup coaches from the 30s and the 40s. He coached Ash, okay, and, um, and his historic win over Connors at Wimbledon. And then uh, we were close to Salisbury, Maryland. So a lot of tennis people don't know that Salisbury, Maryland, at one time was the indoor tennis capital of the world. A guy named Bill Reardon lived there, and Bill Reardon was Jimmy Connors' manager. So as a kid, Connors, Nastasi, Borg, all those guys were coming through there regularly. So I kind of fell in love with the game, uh, realized at a very young age um, that I wasn't good enough to, to play at that level, but wanted to coach. And, um, you know, Connors was, a, was actually a, a great um, person for the young people at the time in the 70s. So that's kind of where my background. And then how did you – get into coaching because I mean I think that if anyone wants to look you up and think about you know your your history um you coach the Bryan brothers like how does this come together uh so a lot of as Justin Gimelstad will say it's a it's being a lifer in the game you know getting out of college and deciding that you know I wanted to get into coaching my father wanted me to get into business and I'll never forget him me telling him now nah, I want to coach tennis and then uh moving back to Delaware after college and coaching some girls um Kim Schiff, who I don't know if you guys know, she was very good. And then we're starting a girl named Madison Bringle. I don't know if you know Madison. She had a nice win over Serena a few years ago. I work with a girl named Cam Mora now, who is um, number one at North Carolina, semifinals NCAA Division One. Had some other good players along the way, like Dale Cathel, who went um, three sets with Gimmelstab, uh, went with three sets with Goldstein. So got into that. And then as I was playing, I also coached a young man named Davidson Kozlowski. His father is Dave Kozlowski, who I work for. Do you know Inside Tennis with the Cos? Yes, yes, absolutely. Yeah, there you go. You know the Cos. So Davidson and I uh, coached Davidson and then started playing a lot of different tournaments with Davidson. And w along the way, I uh, met Dave McPherson as we were out there playing. And Dave McPherson, obviously the coach of the Bryan Brothers, and we started to collaborate and do a lot of different clinics and things together. And, uh, you know, Macker is just a great guy. And, and as time has moved on, you know, we formed a partnership in order to, uh, to coach. So it's been fun. I want to go back to, to the Bryans. You know, did you travel on tour with them? What years were you part of the team? And um, were you always co-coaching or were you ever the one in charge as well? Well, at different times, you know, I wouldn't say in charge, um, you know, co-coaching. Uh, at different times, I'm the one we call it on the bag, as John Isner would say. I'd be the one on the bag that day because I was at the tournaments and doing the day to day stuff. Uh, but, you know, it's always collaboration with Macker. Um, you know, we always go back and forth. We're very detailed 
about our notes and about our scouting reports of what we're doing with different players and uh, against different players and, you know, what we need to do for Mike and for Bob. So, yeah, I would say more of a collaboration. I would say I was the quote unquote coach, um, you know, we're together. So. So obviously we're aware of the Bryan brothers, their success. I mean, it's just, it's one for the record books. What would you say are one of the few things that really stick out to you as kind of the detailed things that make them so good, make them so great that it's, just, I mean, you really can't describe it. I get it. They're twins. Can't really beat that, but I'm just curious. I mean, give us some insight. Oh, well, they're competitive. Okay. And they're competitive in everything they do, whether it's playing cards, whether it's playing chess, you know, tiddlywinks, whatever. So that competition and that drive forces them and wants them to keep going forward. Um, a good friend of mine, I play a lot of doubles with Ellis Ferreira, once said, uh, I don't know if you know Ellis, he's a couple of time Grand Slam champion. He said that on the pro tour, there's, there's two types of people that after they lose the guy that goes to the practice court, because that's what they do. And that's kind of what their rhythm is. And then there's the other person that goes to the practice court because they lost and they're driven by that loss. I would say Mike and Bob are, are driven and they are the utmost professionals at what they do. Um, you know, we, we lose a match in Antwerp in 17. We spend the next week, two a days at the David Lloyd tennis center, uh, practicing and practicing and practicing. We practice every day with a guy named McLaughlin, who I don't know if you know Ben or not. He's a very nice player out of California. And that ends up three years later paying huge dividends because that was who we beat in the finals at Delray. You know, so you get a chance to see someone's game and they let McLaughlin come into that practice session because they just want to get better and keep going and keep going. So I say they're driven. Do you have any best memories that stand out from your experiences with them? Oh my gosh, yeah. <laughs> bit of a, a memories, long list, maybe. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I got a long list. Um, you know, winning at Monte Carlo was special. It was, you know, Mike, Bob, Indrick, and I, and uh, you know, going to the palace with Prince Albert and uh meeting, you know, Prince Albert in the palace and then um struck up a conversation with his daughter Jasmine. Um and then got Jasmine and Prince Albert and the boys. Uh, playing music in the palace and she was singing and so that was wow. that was really cool I mean that was to see Prince Albert you know on the drums jamming away and I have video of it it was just you know that's that's pretty neat yeah so, at least. so yeah I got a lot of memories um, great memories and you know at Wimbledon um, probably one of the biggest uh, things you know you talk about you know Mike and Bob but talk about um, Nadal just for a second uh, they have two locker rooms at Wimbledon. They have the regular locker room and they have the champions locker room. Okay. And uh, when you ever, you know, as a coach, you go in the champions locker room, you're like, Oh my God, you know, this is like, you know, you've amazing. made it. You've made it. Yeah. yeah you've made it yeah, yeah. any locker room at Wimbledon, but you've made it there. I mean, they've got a guy, the guard, you know, that doesn't let you in unless you have the mm -hmm. proper credential. Um, Rath had just lost um, that match to Djokovic in 18 and, um, we were there, obviously, you know, we won that year with uh, Mike and Jack Sock, but um, John Isner, who Mac also coached, has made an unbelievable run to the semis to play Kevin Anderson. And after the match was over, Nadal came in, and it was the classiest thing I've ever seen. He went up to each and every one of the attendants and thanked them for their efforts. And I thought, you know, my God, look at this guy. He just lost the Joker in a great match. And here he is coming into the locker room and thanking each and every attendant, every kid, everybody there. So yeah, a lot of unbelievable memories. Got some cool memories of Fed as well and different players. So, all right. Ooh, oh, give us, give us a Fed. Yeah, we love Nadal. some Fed stories. Love Nadal. Nadal I know too, we yeah. do love Nadal, but. Yeah, I mean, stories. Nadal is such a nice guy. Um, in the finals of Monte Carlo before we played, I was in the locker room and what happens at these tournaments is it starts out and it's, you know, there's so many people. And then as you go, there's so few people. And he was obviously in the finals that year and it was getting ready to be Mike and Bob's birthday. And I needed to get a clip from him wishing them a happy birthday. And so you're nervous walking up to, you know, one of the greatest tennis players of all time. And, you know, so I walked up to him in the locker room and said, you know, Raph, I'm sorry to bother you, but can I, uh, can you say happy birthday to Mike and Bob? And he goes, yes, yeah, sure, sure. 
no problem. So I turned the video on and he goes, puts his hand up, goes, who am I saying happy birthday to again? I said, yeah, Mike and Bob. But he was so nice that he was going to do it, whether it was Mike or Bob or whether it was, you know, my uncle Tony. Do you know what I mean? And it was just, and he's the guy's getting ready to play a finals of, you know, a master series 1000. And yeah, what a great guy. So, yeah. And fed, um, you know, a couple different little, you know, small stories. Um, he, he's such a, we were in Mexico. Uh, he played the match against Sasha and we were the underside of that match. He had a doubles exhibition ahead of time. So Mike and Bob played against Santi Gonzalez and Rays and, um, you know, we're in this little trailer and, you know, Fed comes up and thanks that you should have persons for coming. And then you look down and there's a, um, everyone, do you know what, a, you know, a credential, correct? Mm-hmm. You know, tournament, everyone's got one. Yeah. So everyone's got their picture, but not Roger. His credential just says Roger Federer, you know? So I pick it up and I'm like, that's when you know you've made it, Raj. Yep. There's no picture needed. And he just kind of laughed. I mean, what a class guy. I mean, so super nice. You know. That's awesome. Cool how humble how humble they are and how normal they seem and you're making them seem like they're just normal really nice guys <laughs> which which I guess they are and it's really cool that you've gotten these experiences to be up close and personal with them while working with two of the absolute greats and doubles like right. legends of the game and and I wanted to ask you you know what was your response when they chose to retire earlier this year Well you know it was I don't know do you guys know who Jay Berger is Yes. Yeah. Okay. Yes. So Jay is a great guy. We were, and he's coaching Riley and we were at Del Rey and I was sitting there and um, I've known Jay for years. Jay's from New Jersey and, you know, played for Chuck Creasy at Clemson. And, and I said to Jay, I said, I'm a little nervous about this one. And I said, well, and he said, why? I said, well, this could be our last final. And he looked at me and said, nah, it's not gonna be the last final. They'll, they'll, they'll gut it. I said, well, we're retiring. And you just, you know, nothing is ever promised in this life. You know, there's, you know, there's an old saying, you know, tomorrow, you can't worry about tomorrow, you got to worry about today. And that's how the, you know, the Bryans are, they worry about the, the up close and personal. And, you know, I said, well, you know, I, I don't want to be the guy that, you know, we lose on the last one. And, and sure enough, they, the boys pulled it out. And I, I don't know if you, do you remember that match at all? Uh, we I was, lost I- I was in Delray that year, so right. I don't remember, yeah, or that. We lost the first set 6-3, and then it was 5-all, and, and Bob hit an amazing slice back in on the line, kind of wrong-footed Bainbridge, and then they went on to roll the rest of the match. But, um, yeah, to, we were in Indian Wells, and then the pandemic hit, and then the decision was after World Team Tennis to not not play, um, to just um, – because they didn't want to retire with no fans. They wanted – you know, they're always the fan favorite. They enjoy the fans. They enjoy, you know, at the atmosphere of the professional, you know, arena. So you can say you were not surprised at all then? Uh, I w- with the pandemic, no, I wasn't. I was, you know, so, you know, it's like we said, it's nice to go out on top of the, your last, you know, tournament is a win. I mean, how many people can say that? I know Macker won at Newport on his last pro tournament, but I mean, how many people can go out besides Pete Sampras winning the U.S. Open and say, good night? Yeah. You know, so like, <laughs> that's true kind of, it's like after they they won they signed this you know which is kind of cool 119 wow yeah, yeah. that's insane yeah. hey everyone you're listening to the tennis.com podcast with special guest coach dave marshall he's sharing how he teamed up with the greatest doubles team in the world the Bryan brothers keep listening for more yeah obviously i mean there's no one that can ever really say anything in regards to their success and this pandemic i know that they've retired but i'm just curious how it's affected you in a sense i mean i know that you have your facility but what have you been up to during this whole pandemic uh just you know doing my thing teaching tennis and uh doing stuff um communicating with different you know trying to help some other players with some different things on the on the tour you know that kind of stuff but you know just staying busy you know it's you mentioned Sorry, you, meant, you mentioned Madison Brangle. That was a singles player. Do you also work with doubles players now actively? Like, is it both singles and doubles players? You, you uh, anyone, I, would, everyone? I wouldn't say I, I work. I mean, I help. Um, you know, we became a, very close with uh, Vaseline, Eduardo Rogers Vaseline, because Mike played with him. Uh, we lost in the finals of Vienna. We lost in the finals of uh, Washington. So, you know, I do a lot of different back and forth with uh, Eddie on – you know, notes about matches, about matchups, who he's playing in the world championships and that stuff. So, you know, we had worked hard on uh, improving his serve 
And that's one of the biggest things that, you know, you look at Mike and Bob at uh, being the ultimate competitors. Um, you know, Bob, we spent a ton of time working on his return. And I can show you video of just different things that you, you would say, you know, there's a Hall of Famer putting a tennis ball underneath his arm so he can extend his arm and get the proper follow through and the proper finish. And then you look at Mike Bryan, you know, in Delray, we're out every night working on his serve for an hour and a half, you know? So, I mean, these guys are driven. I mean, Vaseline, you know, we gave him a football because guys that are from Europe don't play a lot of American football. They play soccer. So the fact of throwing a ball is a little contrary to them. So with, with Vaseline, he's working on trying to get in full pronation on his serve and trying to, you know, up the pat, up the pace. And he's playing next year with Cotton, which is going to be, you know, that's going to be a tough team, you know, with Eddie's returns and, and Cotton serve. It's, that's going to be tough. Speaking of next year, I understand that nothing is promised. We have established that. But I'm just curious what, if you're going to be traveling at all, are you going to be doing a lot of virtual coaching? I mean, that's kind of like what that, life that's is good, like today. That's a good question. So what we're doing right now, what Mike and Bob and I are trying to do is we're trying to set up a lot of clinics throughout the U.S. So kind of like a Brian brother clinics at different uh, clubs. So we have about 15 clubs that have uh, kind of signed on. So that's kind of, you know, what I'll probably be doing to be running my club and, and traveling and doing clinics with the, with the guys. So it's kind of, kind of, you know, if that's fun, that'll be, you know, that'll be good. Play a lot of spades, play a lot of hearts. So <laughs> I was wondering what they would be doing next. And I imagine it'd be very, very involved still in the sport, of course. Yeah. I mean, you know, I know a couple of different guys have reached out to, um, to Mike to see if he would work with them, um, you know, and you know, they would be, uh, unbelievable coaches um, if they ever, you know, chose to do that. So, um, you know, there you go. I still think they can play, but, you know, if they decide they want to retire, that's up to them. I'm just curious. I mean, obviously I know that both of them are quite family oriented, but um, what have you talked to them? Like what is their day to day now? Yeah, no, I talk, I talked to them a bit. Uh, that's for sure. Um, so Bob's day to day is he plays a lot of chess from what I understand um, you know, and he is, he is Mr. Dad, um, you know, he, he and Michelle, I mean, they're a fantastic couple and, you know, they have three kids. I mean, Michaela is so talented. She's a good little tennis player, but she's an unbelievable musician. Uh, Richie is, you know, just a, a bulldog. I mean, that, that, that young man, have you ever seen Richie? I mean, that guy is going to be a, a pro, either football player or, or something. And then Bobby is going to be the president of, uh, the fraternity or, <laughs> the president of a company bobby is just the most outgoing young man you'll ever want to meet he'll go walk into a room and he'll have you know everybody uh, as his friend so and then you know mike and nadia have just had a great you know child jake and they're, they're out in uh, salt lake now out in park city uh doing some stuff there so um yeah so they you know and mike you know, and nadia getting married it's and having a child i mean that's just been a blessing that's for sure so. That's awesome. We briefly mentioned him, but you mentioned Jack Sock as someone he teamed up with Mike for that almost, I think it was almost a year. And they obviously did remarkably well together. But how different was it having a different partner with a Brian brother? I know he just got married too. Yeah, Jack. Yeah, no, Jack's a great guy. Um, Jack is an unbelievable athlete. I was thought, um, I was a pretty good high school basketball player. And I, when I would, you know, on the tour, I'd watch these guys play. And you watch Jack Sock play basketball and then Nick Curios. I mean, Nick is an amazing basketball player. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever seen him play basketball. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, you, you see these guys and you think, okay, you know, Nick probably could have played basketball at a much at a higher level. You know, Jack definitely could have played um, another sport at a higher level. Um, it, it was it was special working with Jack. He was awfully nice. Uh, respectful, which was great. Um, you know, Nolsey, Mark Knowles was his coach at the time. And Nolsey is just a, a great uh, guy, doubles guy as well. And, you know, so it was, it was nice, you know. Do you have a certain coaching philosophy? I don't know if anyone's ever asked you for it. You know, you have a, a rich resume, but do you have a certain, I guess, certain things that, that are true to you as Dave Marshall, the coach? Yeah. I mean, I think it's so important to know the fundamentals, um, you know, from the very beginning, you know, knowing how to work someone from, you know, the proper grips to uh, understanding that every, like in tennis, every point doesn't have the same value. And a lot of people don't understand that. 
And, you know, so each point has a different value. So you have to do certain things early in a match in order to get the, the point later in a match because you have to win the most important points. So we talk about, you know, having a goal setting up and the Bryans are so great at figuring stuff out. Um, you know, on the tour, we, we, you know, we give them no cards and um, I don't, do you guys know who Lee Shiras at all? Yeah, of yeah. course. Okay. And Robbie Koenig. So a lot of those guys are announcers. I, I would share some of those no cards with, and, and Leaf, who, who was just an unbelievable player, played at Princeton with my buddy, Flip Rubin. Uh, Leaf would, um, we would talk about that, about having a game plan. And the Bryans would be able to take that game plan and then adjust it on the fly. And, and that's important because you just can't go out and not have a game plan. You have to go out and have an, an understanding of what you're trying to accomplish. Hi, listeners. This is an episode with Coach Dave Marshall. He's regaling us with his best memories from the tour with the Bryan brothers. Keep listening. And you've also worked with a lot of, I mean, we've always talked to Bryans a lot here because that's the most natural topic, but you've worked with a lot of young players, college players, a lot of successful youth. What's your take on the going to college versus the going straight to pro, pro route? I'm sure you talk about this with parents and kids all the time. Well, yeah, it's, it's difficult. Um, you know, it's, so few people make it at the professional level that it's so important to go to college. And if of those people I talked about with Kim Schiff's, the Jesse Robinson, who played at Duke and won NCAA title that I coached, um, Shannon Buck, who was 10 in the nation division one, Kim Schiff. I mean, they're all, they're doctors and they're lawyers now. And that's at the end of the day, that's as a tennis coach, what you want is you want someone to act, have self-actualization to be the best person they can be. Now, if they have the talent of a Jack Sock, a Mike or Bob Bryan, that's one thing. But if they have unbelievable talent, but yet they can take that talent and turn it into a college education. You know, John Isner went to college at Georgia. Tennis went to, you know, obviously went to college. You look at Kravis and Nice, they were at Auburn. They went to college, you know, won the French Open, and they're unbelievable players. So, yeah, college, college is a good, is good. good way to go. <laughs> good way to go. You know, it's tough. You know, look at Riley and, and Tommy Paul, the upcoming Americans now, and, you know, they have unbelievable talent, you know, so it's tough it's to different. stay pro. Yeah, each case, each case seems to be different, and but I feel like everyone kind of leans towards the college. And then do you have any advice for young coaches who are just out of college trying to get their foot into the tour, trying to work with really talented players? Any tips? Is there is there a trick to figuring this all out? <laughs> um, I wouldn't say there's a trick. I would say it's a long road. Um, if, if you would go back to, to me at 16, when I told my dad, I wanted to coach and, um, him giving me a bucket of balls and set me up with the local parks and rec. And if you would say someday, you know, you'll be coaching in the finals of Wimbledon and the kid, you know, we played Clawson and, and, and Venus, uh, in the finals and Clawson's coach, uh, Stefan de Kock from South Africa is a young guy that worked for me in Delaware. So we're playing the finals of Wimbledon and, you know, we got two coaches that, uh, and he started working for me when he was 18 years old. So, you know, it's, it's a long road and whether or not you get to that portion of it, that's great, but just enjoy the journey and do the best for each client along the way to help them reach, you know, the best that they can be. You know, we talk about, you know, you think about Jay, Jay's burger is uh, coaching an Ibis country club now and we have text messages back and forth. And it's not about, you know, Riley Apelka, who he's coaching and doing a great job. Jay's an unbelievable coach. Do you know what it's about? What? His club ladies. How can Ooh. Jay Burger get them better? So, right. You, you, you don't believe me. I'll show you the text. I believe message. you. I believe you. I sent, I sent him like 15 drills of things that he could work on with his club ladies. So he's putting as much time and effort into that as he is obviously into Riley. So he wants, no matter who they are, he wants them to win. And that's, that's what a tennis coach has got to do. You got to celebrate that student and get them and lift them to the best that they can be. Honestly, it also adds variety to his coaching style and skills and all that. So that's right. awesome. Yeah. Club yeah, ladies sure. are serious. Well, what yeah, is, trust yeah, me, they true. are. Very, <laughs> very serious. What, what does your day-to-day, -day norm, a normal day-to-day -day in the life of Dave Marshall look like? Um, maybe even though it's COVID, I think that things are still open. Tennis is definitely socially distanced. So what is, yeah. what is life like? Yeah, tennis is the number one social distance sport in, in, to me in the world, um, 78 feet apart. Uh, 
So more, normal day, I get up around 637, um, try to get into the office by eight, be on the court usually by 839, teach till about 12, take a couple hours for lunch, go home, get some lunch, come back, uh, teach from two to seven, and then, uh, you know, hit the gym or play some tennis myself that night, go home, repeat, do it all again the next day. So, <laughs> wow. Groundhog yeah, day. You still play, you play a lot and you play at a very high level. I am probably it's one of the worst players to have some decent wins. So yeah, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Well, we look forward to seeing you hopefully on the bag as John Isner would say, and on the tour. And I know that there's a lot of uncertainties with 2021, but thank you so much for taking the time. It is oh, truly an honor to speak with uh, the guy that was behind the scenes with the legends of Brian brothers. So uh, thank you. Ever. Well, it's been a treat to talk with you as well, and we appreciate your time. Thank you so much. Thank you. From the Tennis Channel Podcast Network, this has been the Tennis.com Podcast. Be sure to subscribe to stay caught up. We're available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and every major listening app, as well as Tennis.com slash podcasts. You can also see the videos of our episodes on Tennis Channel's YouTube page and Tennis.com's Facebook page. We're your hosts, Nina Pantic and Irina Falcone. We'd like to thank our team, editor and audio designer and video editor, Christina Koseva, producers, Alexa March and Sean O'Malley, and executive producers, Shelby Coleman, Kyle Einhorn, and Andy Chu.